our first keynote tonight is uh, Austin Choi Fitzpatrick. Um, he is coming from, to us from San Diego. Um, his talk's gonna be on The Good Drone. He's a author, educator, speaker on politics, culture, technology, and social change. Uh, his books include The Good Drone and what slaveholders think, sorry, I had a typo on my sheet. Um, pub, he's published uh, works in Slate, Al Jazeera, The Guardian, Aeon, and Tikkun. So without any further ado, I will play the intro. And single. How are y'all doing? I'm really happy to be here. Um, can I get this deck up? Is that possible? I'm gonna talk about drones today, uh, and I'm gonna talk about them from a slightly different perspective, I think, than we're accustomed to hearing about drones. Um, when we think of drones, oftentimes we tend to think of large platforms that go around the world, um, increasingly deployed by militaries. And I'm gonna talk about an incredibly different kind of drone, the kind that actually are increasingly used by hobbyists and being used by creative industries and being used by a whole host of activists and community organizers and social movement folks. I'm a sociologist. Um, I teach at the University of San Diego, and I'm also a faculty member at the University of Nottingham. I'll talk a little bit about what I do in some of those places, um, but what I'm gonna be focusing on today is talking about drones and then asking some larger questions about what it is that like, focusing on drones and other forms of new technology can tell us about uh, protests, uh, policy engagement, human rights, this sort of thing. But since I'm here, and since we are talking and you all are talking at this conference today about collaboration, I'm going to also spend some time talking about, and I went through and like shuffled my deck uh, in terms of what I was gonna be talking about today. Is this mic on? Can we turn this off? Um, I, in terms of what we're talking about today, specifically reflecting on where it is that the projects I've worked on have had collaborations in, 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 the, in, the, in the frame. So I'm gonna focus on that in particular. So, the, so I started thinking about drones in the way that I'm going to be talking about them today, as a tool for good, as a tool for enhancing democratic discourse, debate, and social movements. In the middle of a protest in Budapest, I was there living as a, as a professor at the time at an American university and was teaching classes on human rights, teaching classes on human rights advocacy, and my students and I decided we we're gonna buy a drone and we we're gonna use this drone to document large protests. So the protest that you see here rolling behind me, it's from a larger sort of video that, I, that our team did together with the sort of investigative journalist community there in Budapest. This is a protest against a new tax on the internet. It was a, gig, a euro per gig, and the idea was that this is the way that the struggling government would cover their books, would, would, would help balance their books. And this got resistance from pensioners and students and small business owners and large business owners from conservatives and progressives, young people, old people. A bunch of people didn't like this idea. And so people turned out in the streets in the tens of thousands. And we, we had our drone there. We worked with folks working on the ground. We released a video that sort of went viral by those standards um, in a sort of a smaller country. But viral and there's a larger protest that was planned and in each one of these moments the the president or the, the prime minister said that it was the same handful of disgruntled young people around the streets again and we didn't have to listen to them now just like we didn't have to listen to them before the challenge was that we the investigative journalist folks citizen journalist journalism folks my human rights advocacy class we had actually started using this drone to document protests, and we'd been to those small protests. We were actually here at this large protest, and it documented how many people there actually were on the ground. And so we released this, we released this footage. Um, we worked with the folks on the ground. They all held their cell phones up to the camera, which you can see here. Everybody had their flashlight features on and their phones. And we were able to demonstrate through this footage, which two across two different protests released this footage, went very, viral very quickly. 
And the prime minister ended up having to cave. And so they withdrew this policy and the tax sort of bill went away. Um, this briefly caught the international community's attention. The fact that this protest movement had, had emerged, it wasn't the same handful of protested, but the largest protest since 1989, since the, since the collapse of the Soviet Union and the freedom of Hungary. And this actually led to this larger conversation about two things. First of all, what's the role of this kind of new technology in civil society, which I'll talk, spend more time talking about. But it got me thinking, how is it we actually estimate how many people are at a crowd? So as we all know, crowd size matters. This is something that I don't need you to, you don't need me to tell you, right? This is something we intuitively can recognize. When we see a large number of people, it means that they're really for or against something. When hardly when it shows up, it means they're probably not as supportive or as opposed to the policies we might, we might like or expect. So this led to another line of thinking, like, well, how do we, how do we estimate how many people are in a crowd? And so I, a team and I set out to actually develop a methodology um, that is, can be used to estimate transparently and in a sort of transparently accountable way how many people are at a protest. So we published this in an engineering journal, and this kind of went on. It has its own, its own life. But this was a first step in me asking, OK, so we've got this new technology in the air, what does it actually mean for what we know about civil society, politics, protest, et cetera? So I sat down with my students. My first puzzle was, well, how many, where is this even happening? How many people are even using drones? And I'm talking about drones, but quadcopters, small things, not big fixed wing weaponized platforms, but the small drones that any of us can go and buy on Amazon or anywhere else. So, we, so I sat down with my students and we ran a report. We actually like scoured the internet. You know, we scoured like five, seven years of, of, of reports on the internet about how drones are being used. And we wrote a whole report up and published it. Um, and it's open access and you can download the data and play with it if you'd like to. But one of the striking findings from this study was something that frankly surprised us because we didn't know what we'd see. We didn't know what we'd see because nobody had done a study like this before. What we discovered is that only a handful of the uses of these small drones were to do the kinds of things that we all freak out about, like spying and crime. So if you see the two arrows up there, they're pointing at two of the smallest slivers. And those are the uses that count where people were using drones for spying and for criminal activity. Does this make sense? So you see this clear explosion. If you follow drone technology, that's when the DJI Phantom and the Parrot were both, were both sort of launched. So this takeoff point in about 2012 is when this technology started becoming ubiquitous, affordable, easy to fly, et cetera. What didn't change is how many people were using this technology to do like crummy things. So this was surprising to us, and it led us to then sit down and do a couple of case studies about where drones are being used in a positive way. Here's, a, here's an exhibit. This is a group called Zipline in Rwanda. I take students there every year. They are a blood bank that has essentially created an edge-to-edge -edge distribution system across the country of Rwanda, which you can actually cover by drone from the center to the edge in about 30 minutes. And that same amount of time by road, if you're delivering blood, plasma, or some other life-saving um, sort of inter medical supplies or medical intervention, can be hours. And if, road, if there's a rainy season or something, sometimes the roads might be impassable. So it dramatically cuts down the amount of time it actually takes to get life-saving technology from the center of the country to the edge. This is a distinct feature of Rwanda, because Rwanda is relatively small in size. You can get edge to edge really quickly. Um, but this technology is not limited just to Rwanda. Um, there are folks using this technology to replace helicopters or fixed wing aircraft in anti-poaching efforts. And so there are folks who actually have small drones that they are deploying in the field in order to, to support anti-poaching efforts. You can track either the, the animals themselves and know where your elephant population is, for example, or you can use them to surveil unusual activity where there shouldn't be people wandering around with guns in a particular protected area, flag them, alert the authorities, and the authorities can step in and do something about it. So technology, so, so drone technology is being used in these ways. It's also being used to sample water to get at places we couldn't get at before. You drive up in a boat and you sample the water, then your boat is in the water where you're sampling. I won't bore you with the scientific um, sort of back end, but it disturbs the environment that you're in. Drones can actually come in and, and sample directly from places where you wouldn't want to disturb the ecosystem, like water sampling, for example, or where you really shouldn't be or can't, like volcanoes. You can now just fly, fly drones into volcanoes and like grab stuff and leave, which we wouldn't want to be doing because we'd melt. So drones are actually able to do these things in a number of places that we couldn't get to or where, where being there would have sort of fouled up the sample. It's also allowing us to more rapidly do things we were able to do before. So sampling over top of uh, vegetated areas and figuring out sort of what's happening in those places. This is important for farmers. 
That's cool. Farmers are cool. I love farmers. But this also applies to environmental advocacy. So we have areas of deforestation, essentially, where um, illegal logging interests know exactly how the Ministry of the Interior monitors uh, deforestation and illegal logging. Illegal logging. How do they do it? By coming by boat through remotely in, remote and inaccessible areas. So look at this image on the right. It's hard to see maybe with the lights, but the, uh, the clearing, the, the illegal logging in this image has been done at the other side of a large stand of trees where the officials who go down the river will go in their boats, look and see trees on either side, and say there's no illegal activity here. Does this make sense? That perspective completely changes from the air. You can't get away with that from the air. Now, can any government anywhere afford to always be flying airplanes and satellites over every inch of their country in order to be monitoring illegal activity? And let's say that place is, let's say, the Amazon. The answer is no. So drones actually, in this case, lower the price of something we could already do with airplanes. So drones are changing some stuff we think about politics, changing stuff we think, what we think can be done around environmental advocacy, and changing what we think can be done um, in a number of areas where we are already doing stuff. But then we have a new puzzle. Where will these things fly? This is something that's very, very underspecified. Public policy on this is sort of uh, um, up in the air. Will they fly sort of in, in, in routes? Like will they be small highways in the sky where these things will fly? Or will they, will they all have some sort of artificial intelligence conflict avoidance relationship with one another and they'll fly dynamically and just sort of like, I don't know how murmurations of larks do it, but not bump into each other in this way? Where will they go? This is an important issue of public policy. I live in a densely populated city. And nobody wants these things flying over all of our houses and communities and beaches and wilderness areas and the places where we ski. So the question is like, well, where will they fly? Important puzzles for public policy. And I think this is a, an, an important area where we need to have discussions about some of these strengths, but also the difficult conversations about what's gonna happen next. Um, so what is all of this, like what's the bigger picture here? And this got me thinking more about space. Right? So new technology, I already said this, new technology in the air changes politics on the ground. And it got me thinking about the arts. And it got me thinking about there's this whole movement, a, a movement in the 70s in, in architecture and in a couple of different artistic communities that was rejecting the museum circuit, the New York City-based museum circuit. Right? So where do, we do, where do we do our art? This is the spiral jetty, this famous piece right, that can be viewed from space. This is a picture from Google Maps. So this is an art installation that I appreciate, maybe you appreciate, that you're viewing from, you know, orbit, right? So where, so where are canvases? Where does our art belong? Where are the places that we can actually produce creative, creative stuff, right? Um, here's another version of something that is on the ground and can only be seen from space. This is a three mile long poem by the Chilean by a Chilean poet, and it says in Spanish, no shame, no fear. He's tortured by the Pinochet regime, and this is, his, this is his response. His response to the torture he suffered under an authoritarian regime was to write a three mile long poem in the desert that only you can see. And if you were in the desert, you couldn't see it. So who, so who is art for? Where, do we, where are viewers? Where's the, where, where do our, our installations belong? And again, new technology in the air changes politics on the ground, as I hope I demonstrated with protest in Hungary. But it also changes what kind of places emerge as canvases, what kind of places we can actually make our voices heard. Um, I came to those two studies after I was contacted by an activist in Hungary, again, I was, while I was living there, who said there is this large stadium that needs a large parking lot, and the mayor wants to bulldoze a community right next to, the, to, the, to this entire um, stadium in order to build a parking lot. The problem is, who's that, whose community is that? The community belongs to the Sinsa Roma community. Right, this radically marginalized ethnic group that's been, that has been punished through the Holocaust, punished and, and economically and socially marginalized across Europe for time out of mind. And so the mayor was using the excuse to build a parking lot in order to bulldoze a community that he, of people he didn't want in his community. Right? So the activist who approached me said, you know, this is really great that they need a parking lot, but there's actually an empty field right here. And so the stadium's here, and he wants to bulldoze this area, but there's a stadium right here. And he said, what if I sneak in in the middle of the night with a, bull, with, a, with a pickup truck, and I dump a load of rocks, and I make a parking sign there, and we fly a drone over it? So we created a parking sign on the ground, and then we flew the drone over this marginalized community, and then over the stadium, and then over this, over this parking sign. The punchline to the video was, this is a community, 
this is a stadium that needs a parking lot, and you could put your parking lot right here, right? But the way to tell that story was actually com more compelling, I would argue, because we were able to represent visually that thing I just did. I just did a flyover in front of you. And you can see, actually, the relationship between these things. And then ask yourself, well, if it could be here, why would it be there? And it invites this larger question about political representation, about, about economic marginalization, and invited larger conversations about why it was that there were people going in in the middle of the night and breaking the windows in this community in order to say it was a derelict community that should be, should be plowed under anyway. So these, these ways of representing what's on the ground, technology changes our ways of representing what's on the ground, artistically and in terms of advocacy. New technology in the air also changes what we think of the sky and the ground. This is the best graphic I have to represent this. This is uh, an artist named Ruben Pater. He's Dutch, and he put this thing together um, that allows people on the ground to identify weaponized drones by their silhouettes. And on the other side, there's a whole section on how to hide from drones. So in this new book, I have an entire section on how to take drones out of the air, how to hide from drones, Right? It invites new kinds of political relationships with the sky. And so if we have new technology in the air, it invites new thinking about politics, it invites new thinking about art, and it invites new thinking about the way that we relate to the sky even. It sounds strange, but I think there's a future for that sort of thinking. It also changes the way we think about vertical spaces. This is graffiti, a graffiti drone from the artist Katsu who has done a number of installations that, in which he's essentially attached a spray can onto a drone. There's entire communities. I, I interviewed these communities from my new book and talked to them about the, the challenges of actually mounting spray paint to drones. And you've got prop wash, and you've got accelerant issues, and there's a whole bunch of really interesting sort of uh, back-end engineering puzzles here. If anybody wants to talk more about this, I'd love to, but I won't bore you with it. But it turns out it's really hard to make a graffiti drone, which is why their first efforts, oops, which is why their first efforts were really just little squiggles that, oops, I don't know, this is not gonna be working, I think. These were little squiggles that were very high up. So we're in like super beta right now on the graffiti drone thing, but the puzzle for, for graffiti and public art has always been the big get and to be seen and to get your art out there and wait in places it couldn't have been, maybe shouldn't have been, in a way that absolutely gets seen. So then the puzzle is, if we have new ways of applying paint, then what new forms of art actually emerge? What, what sort of murals become possible? And if we have new ways of seeing from the sky, then what happens to our rooftops? Our rooftops, new canvases? So again, new stuff in the air changes what we think of what's happening on the ground. Um, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about collaboration because, cool. Um, so, so I'm talking right now about drones, but in this book, which is called The Good Drone and is about drones, I actually also talk about a whole bunch of other technology. Because I'm arguing, when I said new tech in the air changes politics on the ground, I'm not, when I say new tech, I don't just mean drones, I actually also don't mean just new tech, I mean some old stuff too, like kites and balloons, and some slightly older stuff like satellites. So it turns out that there is a whole lot of work that's happening with each of these technologies right now to actually increase the number of eyes we have in the sky to do, like I would say, pro-social stuff, and it increased democratization of who actually can do this. Um, I flew my drone a bunch, and then I bought a balloon. This balloon comes from an organization called Public Labs, and Public Labs actually makes balloon kits. They got started um, during the oil spill in the Gulf, and they were, fly they were just heliuming, like they had two, two liter Coke bottles and a bunch of helium, and they were just completely uh, bootstrapping this sort of operation, and then they started putting together kits for water sampling, DIY water sampling, DIY aerial observ observation. So this is like a $50 balloon kit. You buy the balloon, and they've got a, a 3D printed gimbal, and you can put your GoPro on it, and you can like let the string up, and then you can actually like monitor what's happening on the ground. So this is we're doing this is we're doing this in Budapest. I don't think I have another slide which shows you three minutes later when there's cops all around us and we're in the middle of negotiating with the cops. We're wondering like, what are you doing and why are you flying this thing and are you allowed to fly this thing? And we said yes, you know, with confidence. Um, but this changes also accountability. I'll say this very briefly. Balloons change accountability for those of you who will ask me in the Q and A about privacy and accountability with drones. 
This is the same kind of observation capacity, but it has a string on it. And the string is this basic form of accountability that allows you to say, what's that? And then follow a string down to whoever it is that's holding the end of the string. Does that make sense? Or you see somebody who's looking at their camera or looking at their, their, their phone and is obviously recording video, and you ask them, where are you recording video from? And then follow the string up. So the string, it sounds simple and silly, but the string provides this key line of accountability. At the other end of the spectrum, um, I, at the University of Nottingham, am part of something called the Rights Lab, and the Rights Lab is a consortium of people from a range of, of academics, from a range of academic disciplines, all working together on one key issue, which is stopping slavery. And so we're working on issues of trafficking and slavery, and there's about 100 of us working across disciplinary backgrounds, some folks who are doing interviews, some folks who are, who are looking at environmental issues, and a team of us actually have a satellite lab where we're examining satellite data in order to estimate how many places there are across something called the Brick Belt, which is in Bangladesh, India, and into Pakistan, and it's this belt of brick manufacturing facilities that oftentimes rely on forced labor, people living in, in radical forms of exploitation, living in contemporary slavery. So the question is, how many places are there, how many, how many of these brick kilns are there? And if you go to the Indian government, if you do work in India, which I have, and you ask the government, the government says, we don't know. And you ask them, well, why don't you know? And it just never became important, perhaps, for them to know this fact. Or maybe it's convenient for them to not know this fact. So we're helping them by creating the world's first baseline of how many of these kilns there actually are. So when we support intervention efforts, when we support uh, human rights advocacy interventions, and when we support public policy, we have a baseline of knowledge about how many of these places there even are in order to sample within, sort of you know, a social science approach to this. But how does this happen? This happens through collaboration. It's because we get satellite imagery from Planet Lab, or from Planet, which is the fourth largest holder of, of, of satellite assets after Russia, China, and the United States. So they're giving, they're sharing their footage. It happens because we've got really, really smart people in the Earth observation world who knows how to who know how to read not this image, like I know how to look at this image, but know how to read the data that's behind the image, this, the actual the actual product, the information that's generated by these satellites, who knows how to compare different kinds of satellite feeds to get at better knowledge. So this is a kind of like fundamental collaboration that makes, um, I, I call it team science, but it essentially makes possible better knowledge about what's happening on the ground in an area where there's a real sort of human rights interest in that knowledge being turned into action in order to um, change people's lives. So this is another form of, um, of uh, collaboration. So, I was trying to think of what holds all these stories together, and I'm gonna tell one or two more. And I think what holds these stories together is a commitment to openness, right? A commitment to, what do I have here? What does openness even mean, right? So I actually like pulled up on my Mac, I pulled up the dictionary thing, and I just read them out and I listed them here. Open means allowing passage, exposing to view, making freely available, offering without restriction. So I wanted to, like, to talk today about this, like a fundamental commitment that I have, and I think we all have, to open societies, to open conversations, to knowledge that we share freely with other people, to communities where other people feel welcomed and included, communities that look like us, right? To open communities. We tend not to use this language, but I think the idea of open society is really provocative, and, I, and, and the reason I'm saying this is because I have this new book project um, that actually starts to ask, what does open knowledge look like? Right? So I wrote this book, where is it? Um, it's here somewhere. I wrote this book called The Good Drone. It'll be out next year with MIT Press. And in the process of putting this book together, I asked myself, in step after step, how can this book be as open as possible? Right? Now, the, the world I live in as an academic is one that has been around for a couple of hundred years, and it looks like this. It's this kind of larger web of, of conversations that happen between academics and academic disciplines. This is something, this is a map done by a team at Stanford that actually maps during the Renaissance how letters were flowing, were flowing internationally and how it led to the efflorescence of knowledge across we have people writing in Latin, people writing in French, but this efflorescence of knowledge because people were able to share ideas with one another. That's why I'm in this game. That's why I'm an academic. That's what I like. That's why I'm talking to you all. That's why I went and talked to all these graffiti artists, because I think we should be engaged in this flow of knowledge. The puzzle becomes, though, 
is that oftentimes, I'm speaking especially as an academic, lots of our knowledge gets, it gets trapped in books that are boring to read, or in academic articles, articles that are paywalled, or it gets trapped in academic vernacular that is difficult for people to read. So in the process of, of doing the whole drone project and uh, drones and satellites and everything, oh my, um, my bigger question is like, how does not just technology, new technology in the air change politics on the ground, but how do we start developing modalities for better sharing the information that academics produce? So this is another area of collaboration that I want to share with you all. So the first thing, um, so this got me thinking about open access and like the whole open access movement, which is a larger movement aimed at, if you're, if you're familiar with Creative Commons and intellectual property, this is like kind of opening up for, for the public our knowledge the, uh, from knowledge producers and makes it easy and free to actually read and see and in some cases share. Um, so the first thing I did, I mentioned this report earlier, this report was scraped from the open web and then the report and its data set are, are available with a digital object identifier, a DOI number online and can be do free, freely downloaded. This keeps us honest because the data is out there and you can run the data and say that these charts I produced are wrong. It also makes the knowledge that we produced out of that data freely available because anybody can actually go and read our report. The book that I wrote then went through something called an open manuscript review with a team that I'm working with at MIT. And this book itself was commented on by peer reviewers. So it's published with the university press. So if you know the university press world, it goes out to peer reviewers. A bunch of other people like me who think like I think maybe um, looked at it and grumbled and grumbled and praised and I made changes and, and it went out from there. And that's usually where most books stop. It stops with me kind of getting an a, a, a eye to eye with other academics. But we took it a step further and we put it out on the open web in a format that looks like this. You can go there right now, it's the Good Drone. Um, I, you know, I can give you the URL later, but it's like just sitting there, the Good Drone at pubpub.org. And you can log in and you can make comments on it. You can suggest that I've made mistakes. You can suggest changes, right? And so we actually open this entire process up to the public. So this went through an open review process, right? The next stage is that this is going to be an open access book, which means you can buy the physical book on Amazon, you can buy the hardcover on Amazon, or you can buy the, the Kindle version, but you can also download a free PDF of the book, just completely free. Right? So, so the book is freely available in terms of, its, of the original data. It, the, the book was freely available in terms of inviting the community, other people who are non-academics, to comment on it. Where is it illegible? What, what might be wrong? And then the final product itself is actually going to be free. Right? I'm happy to talk about any of this in the Q&A or afterwards, how we did this. And then I'm taking one, I ask myself, how could this be the freest book ever? And so I'm taking one extra step. And this extra step is we are going to then, after this book is free and out there, we are going to actually open the book to the public in terms of both reception and critique. So we're, we're in the middle right now, together with the Knowledge Futures group at MIT's Media Lab, of building essentially a heads-up display or a dashboard for the book. So you can go and see the book, sort of the PDF, you know, online readable version of the book, and around it you can see how it's being reviewed, what people are saying about it on Twitter, whether or not people actually like it, or worse yet, maybe nobody's talking about it at all. Right? So we're going to start tracking the reception of the book, and then we're going to invite readers of the book to make comments on and change the book itself. So in this way, that static book, which you can buy as a, you can buy the Kindle, you can like download the free PDF, that's the fixed version of the book. But you're also going to be able to, to look at and edit and say, this was really great data when you wrote the book, dude but new things are happening, or actually new laws have been passed, or there's a better way to do this, or ethics have changed, or this public opinion data that you cite is wrong. You all, actually, will be able to log in and make those changes on this book. Does that make sense? That raises a whole host of questions about, about who the author is, whole host of questions about if, it's, if the book is, has an ISBN, that sort of book registration, does this new living version, dynamic version of the book need a digital object identifier that's separate from that book that you may have like on your shelf. We don't know the, I mean, the, the, I really like this because I don't know the answers to any of those questions. And so it's an experiment. And it's an experiment fundamentally with other people. It's fundamentally an act of collaboration. So I've talked about a couple of things and I think all of them are around this like broader theme of open. Open skies, open access, I put open minds, maybe that's too like, you know, highfalutin. Um, but the idea is opening our knowledge to critique and to review and to larger conversations. 
Um, so, how, how am I doing on time? Can somebody tell me how I'm doing on time? Yes, okay, I'm gonna tell you another story. So, if I was out of time, I was gonna say thank you. Um, so, this is me on, on everywhere, Instagram, Gmail, Twitter, everything, HOA fits. And these are, the two, these are my two most recent books, The Good Throne and my last book, um, with slaveholders think I interviewed slaveholders, perpetrators of human trafficking and contemporary slavery. Um, so I'm happy to talk about that too in the Q&A or afterwards if anyone wants to. But since I'm here, I like spent last night tweaking this deck to talk more about collaboration. I'm gonna tell you one more story about collaboration because we've had a bunch of conversations um, last night and then this morning, I learning from you all and what you all are hoping to do here and what you all are actually doing here. And I wanted to talk about a project over the last year and a half that I've worked on that, st that got started from the very beginning and I'll tell you a story from the beginning to end. So, uh, some, so some colleagues of mine at the University of San Diego where I teach and I started talking about how we were going to, I just talked about all these new ways that the arts and drones are intersecting, got me really curious about like what, what's happening in the arts and who's working interdisciplinarily on the arts and who's in the space. So some colleagues and I got together and we started something called Art Builds and we are a, co a collective that is actually drawing together folks from a number of different disciplines to build cool art and to do, build cool public art that sort of plays with big puzzles that exist in philosophy or within the social sciences, but to sort of play with big ideas using big art. Um, and so we got together and we decided we wanted to do, to take a piece of art to Burning Man this year. And so we sat down and we brainstormed, and we brainstormed, any of you know who, who know what a design thinking process looks like? We got started with industry standard brainstorming exercise, which was like a bunch of post-it notes. And this is our whole big going to Burning Man plan. And down here, this one little thing is our actual piece of art, which we wanted to be a sundial. So we got thinking, we want to make a sundial, we want to make a cool sundial for Burning Man. And so we started ske sketching out in napkins what might the sundial look like and what, what, what actually could we, could we build, what would be cool, how would it actually work. We had lots of different ideas. Then if you know the design thinking process, we rapidly prototyped and we got out some Legos and blocks and we started building little things to see how it would look. And then we actually went into the software and we started mocking it up. We decided it would be cool if we built a sundial that actually had a face where the, where the shadow of the sun traces over, over the face of the sundial. It would be cool if you could climb inside of it, we thought. It would be cool if it had like, like bits of, like it had holes on the side, we could put art and then light could come through. We had all these crazy ideas. So we, again, we like rapidly prototyped. We started playing with shadows. We started talking to people who know about light, lighting engineers, people who know about the way that light diffuses through certain apertures and this kind of thing, which is, I'm a sociologist, not, my, not something I know. Then we started asking ourselves, well, if you could climb inside of this design and you could shine light through, then what would happen on the inside? So we started mocking up these, we started doing the mock-ups here and trying to figure out, well, how would the light play? And at what hour would what sorts of words and what sorts of images trace in what sorts of ways? Oh, sorry, that's this. And then we went around and we did a bunch of fundraising because that's the important part of the story. I have no slide for that, the pain and tears of fundraising. Um, but then, and then we started building. And we started building on our campus. We started building this sundial. And we did it with a bunch of students who thought this was a cool project and a bunch of our colleagues who thought this was a cool project and, and set designers who thought this was a cool project and sort of lent, lent us like pieces of their expertise that we poured it in. Um, and then we built this whole thing on a campus and then we stuck it all in a truck. Is that what I, no, we, we actually built it on campus. Oops, sorry. I'm gonna just go over here and do this. Um, and then we tried to ask, we asked ourselves, if we're gonna have these disks where light comes through and, and, and goes into the actual place that we're in, what should those look like? So we worked with the local makers community um, to use the laser, like, you know, sort of laser cutter to actually cut out these bits of balsa wood in order to create the kind, we, we, had, we invited vector images from the community, we just invited people from the community to come with their thumb drives, or with their laptops, and people at our local space called the CoLab um, created, the, created the kind of disks that later went into this, into this installation. We then tried them out to see if they worked on our campus, and then we folded the whole thing up and loaded it into a huge truck and drove it out to Burning Man, right? And then at Burning Man, we built the whole thing up from scratch, so we had to build it twice, that was a real hassle. But we didn't want to bring it back, it was in type. Um, so we built this thing, and it was a sundial, and a sundial that worked in two ways, and I'll tell you about it right now. 
The, the gnomon, which is the, the part that sticks out that makes the shadow, there's a gnomon on the front, and the, and the shadow of the sun would trace its way across the layout for Burning Man, for Black Rock City, and it would tell you what time it was on Burning Man time. And then the entire, the entire uh, artifice itself, this sort of 30 foot long, 12 foot high thing, itself cast the shadow over the playa. And that shadow would then tell you what time it was according to all of these other time markers. And you can see there are holes in the time markers, and maybe you can't see that there are holes in the actual edifice itself. And you can see the light sort of climbing, through, it's shining through there. People climbed on the thing, people climbed inside of it. See if I, yeah, people used these disks, installed them in the inside with a lighting engineer who did all of this, who ran, who ran all the Arduino for the, for the lights, and we tried to figure out how many, how, many, how many lumens do we need in the outside so you can see it by night. I have no idea how to do these things. It was only possible through collaboration, pulling together people in the community who all did this for no compensation, who all did this as a passion project, who all did this because they wanted to play on something that was kind of bonkers, kind of big, and kind of cool, right? So it's not been possible with any one of us. And in the end, we burned it, because I told you we didn't want to take it home. So we burned this thing. We burned it to the ground, and it took a long time to burn, and we swept up all the embers. And now we're having a conversation. Who wants to do it again? What would it look like? Right? What, what, what should the art project actually look like? And so this is the gang that, that got this started. This is us at the, yeah. at the burn, before, before we burned the thing. Um, and we're now we're having this larger conversation about how do, we hit, how do we then start a new cycle that draws on some of the same sets of relationships and resources and knowledge to do something new, right? And so I really, really, really think that there's something strong and important about that kind of collaboration, because it's how we go from that sort of like rapid prototyping early first steps where things are kind of like, you know, we're feeling things out. This is not at all what the final product ended up looking like. But the reason we were, ended up being successful is because you tried, we found what resources we had, we, did, we worked with what we could find, right? There are ideas we had that like were, we didn't do because we just couldn't afford them or they're the wrong, they're the different sort of scale than we could afford. We didn't have the right people for them. But we built with what we actually had, right? And we did that that's in this way that started all the way from like the blue skying on a, on a, with a bunch of post-it notes and some sort of design thinking or you know, design sprint or whatever kind of approaches that, you all, that we are all familiar with. Um, so that's my like, little plug for this entire, it's not about drones at all, but, this, but about the, 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 the really important things and, and, and wonderful things that can happen when we start here. Right? And we start here together, and we identify what resources we have, and we collaborate in order to be part of making the world look more like what we actually want it to look like. Um, and so that, I, I threw that in there for you all, because I think that's a super duper important and like really delightful thing that I see that's happening here, is this beginning of really vibrant conversations about who are we, who's in the room, and where can we take this thing, and what does it look like? And I just wanted to say, like, that's a really, really cool cycle, and I can't wait to see how it works for you all. Um, that's it for me. Thank you all so much. And I appreciate your, your attention and time. So we have about 10, 15 minutes for questions. So if we have any questions from the audience. Super duper. Yeah. Um, I was curious about. Oh. Very official. All right. Um, I was curious about when you're doing these sort of um, open source books and collaborative projects and stuff, uh, is it sustainable in that there's a resource base within academia and within these communities you're moving, or are you working from more of an abundance model where people just have the extra hours in the week, have the extra space in their brain? to kind of, can we give this all to each other, I guess? Or is a resource base necessary for that kind of collaboration? You sort of touched on the, you know, the joys and agonies of fundraising, but <laughs> just wondering, especially for smaller projects with people outside of that sort of academic world. Yeah, so that's a great, that's like such a great question. There's two answers to that, and the first is that I absolutely have to, I mean, so I'm a professor, and I am paid a salary to be a professor. Um, nothing I'm talking about right here is really a clear and obvious part of my job description, right? Um, I'm a sociologist going to doing art at Burning Man doesn't count anywhere on my Vita, you know? So it's like, this is, you know, people are like, oh, great. <laughs> so, so, so in that way, I like have to, like, 
the fact is I have an income and I have a salary, and that's like a very real thing, right? But then everything else, though, is all grants and sweat equity and with a bunch of people who are down to share. And so a lot of it's just sharing economy kind of stuff. Um, and that's the easiest answer to give, but that kind of disappears the fact that I have like a, like a you know, sal that salary makes a lot of that stuff possible. And so I think those two things interplay at, a, at different levels with different folks. But, um, but I think it's an important thing to surface. Great question. Sorry, <laughs> I'm not trying to be that girl, sorry. But um, so I guess with that kind of, um, you have a base of stability with which to produce these projects and the people you're working with hopefully do as well. But do you find that, um, are you, is one of your, um, is one of your objectives to kind of like make space for other people to participate? Like with the, you know, any of us could read your book and help with it. Where, you know, even if we've only got a couple hours a week or something like that to invest in reading and checking or... I'm just wondering if it is, if it is also a way to make space for people that are working from less of a base of security like that to have a way to participate and a voice in these sorts of things. Um. Platform that the platform that hosted the the open review of the book and and with whom we're developing the actual um, this new display this new thing this new way of representing a book um, that platform and those sorts of services are available to people who don't have any resources essentially who can I mean, it's like a way it's like if you think about Wikipedia like sort of create a Wikipedia page or engage in that kind of process um, one of the things that I I'm not clear on is what the best way is for those platforms to create opportunities for everybody to win equally. So even the example you gave is like, oh yes, anybody could contribute to my book. Well then, well, that, what, who's, who wins from that, right? It's the person who wrote the book. So this is a, this is a side note, but my, my, like secret, my secret hope is that actually this living version of the book, I end up like losing control of it because in fact so many authors or so many additional people end up saying things such that the authorship becomes obfuscated. And it'd be really cool to like, I'd love to have like a class action lawsuit against me by the authors, right? And so the authors, like there's uh, this insurrection of, of new authors against, you know, whoever it is that essentially brought that first proof for the sourdough, but then at the end of the day, like there's a bunch of other cooks and chefs and bakers who are like working within that space. Does that make sense? So I, so I think that there's opportunities for this stuff to actually cycle out in its own lives in terms of what it means, what is the author, what is knowledge, who has knowledge. Um, but I think a lot of those are premised on access, knowledge, and time, and those are really continue to be things that people have, people who have lots of resources or don't have so much, you know, have lots of time because they, they you know, the, the one resource is time. And I think that the question is how do we more equitably distribute the gains from new technology um, to, you know, so it's not just the winners who continue to win, but there are other communities that can win as well. For example, I don't have a remuneration model in that project I just described. I didn't even thought about it until just now, right? So I don't have a way of essentially saying, if you make this project better for all of us, you win and we win, and you win economically in some way, and we all win because better knowledge. So I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm talking too long on this, maybe because I don't have a good answer, but that's, that would be one way of actually better distributing some of these, the, these rewards. Yeah. Where? I, I really like the idea of the living book and um, this collaboration and openness with different people. But I'm wondering if there are a bunch of chefs in the kitchen and there's different levels of expertise, um, how it will be, how it will contribute to better knowledge, or why would I want to read something that's um, been contributed to by people that might not have expertise in what they're putting in. Are there limitations to what they can add? Is there someone like fact checking, fact checking what they're saying? So it's a great question. So, so the, the, there's like several different ways you can design this. So one way you could design this is actually to just open it up entirely, in which case it would probably become the favorite playground of dozens of bots. So it would just get rewritten by bots, right? So I can imagine this one version of this is a completely algorithmically destroyed text, right? 
Um, and another would be where, to, to, to your point, where one has to have a certain level of be vetted because one has a certain level of quality contribution um, through some sort of editorial process. And, it, and somewhere in between would be, it's only humans that can comment, but we don't like really judge um, what the content is. And that's, and I think, and, and so there's, we, I could do each one of those. Um, I thought about inviting different subreddit communities to edit the book, you know, and just and seeing how the book evolves separately, treating it like a natural experiment almost. So it really depends on what we want the book to do. And if we want it to represent the best knowledge out there and the most cutting edge knowledge out there, then maybe we need to compensate people who come in and are doing the cutting edge work to make this the cutting edge book. And we don't have first edition, second edition, but it's more like you go and look at the dynamic version of the book and it's the best it can ever be right now, right? Or maybe what we do is we just push it out into the world and see what happens. And those are different, those are both, I mean, if we stop, the other question here is, do we think about this as a book or as an art project? And if it's an art installation, then the fact that it's all of a sudden no longer readable is not a threat, it's a feature. Or it's, a, or it's not a feature, it's like a thing we learn about human nature, which is, wow, people just messed that up. Or, yeah, I don't know. Um, maybe human nature, maybe it's about the platform. So my, that was my long answer. My short answer it has everything to do with what we want to have happen and how we then invite and build the, the space for contribution that will shape whether or not we get very democratic involvement from bots, people, or something that's more, um, sort of has higher thresholds? That's a great question. What other changes uh, do you think we would see in academia if there was more widespread open access to knowledge like this? Uh, we'd have to write better. <laughs> um, so I, I mean, so, so this, is a, this is a great question, and the big question here is, Essentially, over the last couple of decades, major corporations have set up toll booths at every single information highway opportunity possible. So if you're on a campus right now and you want to go and look at an academic article that, and you're able to see it, it's because your university has actually paid a licensing fee for it, and they paid that licensing fee to a bundler, and the bundler is usually a major multinational corporation that essentially earns more money than Apple or Amazon or, I guess, e Uber doesn't make money, but like actually make has, has better revenue than any of these other major corporations that we've all heard of, and they do that simply by charging a tax to universities for the, for the opportunity you have to access knowledge. Now the knowledge you're gonna access might be something that I wrote, and it might be something that you edited. The fact is I write this stuff for free and I never get paid, and anybody who does the editing or who does the peer reviewing is also not compensated. And then that stuff goes and is turned into a PDF. The PDF is uploaded in the cloud. So we're at like four and five cents, perhaps like per year of like cloud storage space that a 30, you know, sort of, sort of kilobyte article might take. And then, that, and, then in court, and, then, and then if your university doesn't have access to it, it says, would you like to pay $19 to read this for three hours? No, right? So where's all that money going? The money's not going to academics and it's certainly not, um, not going into a larger academic ecosystem. It's disappearing into the pockets of, of of major multinationals like Elsevier. And so one of the huge things that would happen is Elsevier's business model would drop out and we'd have to have real conversations about how we distribute knowledge in a way that's equitable and fair. And I think that I think that's there's, there's only upside there. Universities would save money. I live in California, the University of California is currently um, boycotting, if I'm getting this right, Elsevier. They said we're not only gonna deal with Elsevier. And so they're, they're in contract, you know, sort of a contract fight with them over whether or not they're gonna continue paying these tolls for access to knowledge that University of California scholars produce for free. And, and usually if we're, and if we're working with taxpayer dollars, we're actually spending taxpayer dollars on a large grant that helps us deliver results that then we, that then we write for free and gets published for free, but then they collect the taxes. So it's, I mean, collect the sort of a toll. So it doesn't, sorry, it's a long monologue, but it would disrupt financial interests in the academic knowledge distribution model, is a short answer. I, I kind of see the uh, questions that are coming up around publishing as having to do with kind of an extension of the idea of property and property rights and ownership of knowledge. I'm wondering if you could take that question back to your idea about sort of the, the, the drone and the space that drones occupy. Are you worried about the concept of openness with respect to drones creating a counter reaction which says that we control that airspace um, and trying to proper, you know, make, make airspace into property in a sense so that for instance the, um, 
the uh, brick making company that was in, uh, employing slave labor says our ownership extends to this space above us and therefore they want to control what can be observed in that setting? So this is a great question. And so th one of the reasons I, I, I mentioned this report that I did, um, this early report where we tried to map how are drones even being used. One of the reasons I did this is because in that first footage I showed you from Budapest, that first footage, I wanted to take that footage and I wanted to write a quick article, a quick academic article, and just simply say, look, this is a cool thing we saw, it's a cool thing we did, and then, and then the way that the academic world works is you have to mention all the other people who are doing this kind of work. You know, we have to cite them. And I went to go cite who else was doing work on small drones, and nobody was really doing any work on it. And so, the, so, and then I, then I expanded my search not to small drones but big drones, and I discovered there's a huge conversation about the legality of, for example, the United States' use of large weaponized fixed-wing drone platforms in the war on terror. Lots of, hu all of my human rights friends are writing about that and saying this really shouldn't be happening. And at the same time, all of my tech friends were saying, oh my gosh, Amazon is going to have 24-second delivery by drone to your house tomorrow. And then this big conversation was happening about how it was that industry could use drones or shouldn't use drones, and how it was that big governments could or shouldn't use drones. But in the middle is where most of us live, in civil society, in, in, in our neighborhoods, and in our cities and towns, and in the places that we go to like, get away from it all. So the puzzle I was trying to solve for was to ask this larger question, what should we do here, to your question? And I don't know the answer, and I think it should be arrived at democratically, and we should have a real conversation about what to do with drones in the sort of civil society space. When, you, when we all go outside and we look up, should we have to see drones? And I wanted to be sure that conversation was happening with public policy folks, with lawmakers, thinking about us and our air, let's say, rather than just whether or not the military, the US military or other militaries do what they do with these drones, and Amazon does what it does with its drones. And so that's a long way of saying, I think we need to have big debates about that question. And I think that a lot of the laws we looked at, we did an analysis of all the laws in the country, and a lot of laws were focused on essentially either saying drones can't fly in our communities or police drones can't fly in our communities. So more progressive communities were saying police can't have drones, and, and just a random assortment of communities were saying we don't want drones flying in whatever space they're in. Um, I just want to have a larger conversation about that because one thing that I do know in Budapest, I, t I showed you this video and I said that we won that legislative battle. The government withdrew its internet tax policy. But six weeks later, my team and I got an invitation to a conference that was meant to introduce Hungary's new drone law. So we changed public policy for sure, right? So the, and the new drone law said, if there's any police action anywhere, you can't fly over it. Well, what is a police action anywhere, right? Well, that's a great question. And I mean, I, and, and as somebody who's like radically sympathetic and in solidarity with the Black Lives Movement, then the question is like, well, is, well, what about police action means it can't be surveilled? Maybe the police should be surveilled. Maybe it's incumbent on to know what the enforcers of its laws do and how they spend their time and to audit them and hold them to account. And there are clearly communities who wouldn't agree with that statement at all, which is why it requires like a vibrant democratic debate about you know how should we be using these things, and I think we sh and, and that's a, a sort of a larger conversation. I hope we, we start to have more of. Yeah. I can't see. Okay, got time for one more. Um, I have, the, the question is, what's the next project? Um, I have, I think the, to the best of my knowledge, the world's only paired sets of survivors and perpetrators of slavery. We've actually talked to the, 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 the perpetrator and their victim. Um, and so I'm writing a book of their narratives, each of their stories about what it means to be them. Yeah, great. Um, I think that's it. Thank you all so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you.